Have you ever learned important lessons by watching the mistakes of others? That's really a great way to learn, by the way. I mean, certainly we should learn from our own mistakes, but if we can, if we can learn from other people's mistakes without having to go through it ourselves, that's probably the better way to learn. My wife and I are richly blessed to have two wonderful children. They are adults in their late 20s now. They're both spiritually mature Christians using their gifts and talents to serve in God's kingdom, and we couldn't be more proud. When they were growing up, we noticed that they were very different from each other, different personalities. They learned differently. Uh, You could say that Bethany was a strong-willed child. Any of your parents have a strong-willed child? You know what that's like? Okay. And uh, she tended to learn things the hard way uh, by trial and error and personal experience. Her, one of her favorite phrases when she was a toddler is, I do it. I do it. You know. Where's Jimmy? He learned by watching his older sister. And he avoided a lot of mistakes in life by just watching the mistakes of Bethany. From what the Bible tells us about the Apostle Paul, I get the impression that he was a strong-willed child. (laughs) But, you know, we can learn important lessons from the life of Paul, both from his mistakes as well as from his accomplishments. Uh, next month, we'll be starting a new series on the books of First and Second Timothy. And whenever we study a book of the Bible, it's good to know something about the author and something about the original recipients, the original audience of that book. And um, in the case of First and Second Timothy, Paul wrote these books to the young evangelist, the young preacher, Timothy. I say young, relatively young. He was probably in his early 30s. But Paul had been training Timothy. He he had been mentoring Timothy for over 15 years, taking him on mission trips and helping him to develop character and skills necessary for leadership in the Lord's church. The New Testament tells us a lot about Paul and Timothy, and we can learn from their lives. So today, we're going to learn from the life of the Apostle Paul. Next week, we'll consider the life of Timothy. Paul was one of the greatest Christian leaders in history. However, before he became a Christian, he was known as Saul of Tarsus, and he was an enemy of Christ. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. He he says that he was the, the chiefest, the foremost among all sinners. That's how he considered himself. But God still called Saul of Tarsus to become a minister of the gospel and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul was chosen by God for a very unique task. God would use him to bring the gospel to the Gentile communities and to Gentile kings and rulers. God would use him to write 13 of the books in our New Testament. And God would use him to plant dozens of churches throughout the Roman Empire, many in cities, in key locations to help spread the gospel throughout Europe. The story of Saul's conversion is recorded three different times in the book of Acts, so it must be important. It's recorded in chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. Today we're going to look at chapter 9. And uh, in addition to those passages, Paul does refer to his conversion several other times in the epistles, in the letters that he writes. But let's turn to Acts chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 30, but before we do that, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Let's pray for God to speak to us through his word this morning. Let's pray. God, we come humbly before you, and we recognize that we need you. We are dependent upon you, on your wisdom, on your grace, 
on your strength, on your encouragement. And God, we pray that your word would speak to our hearts today. God, we know that you have a purpose for your word in our lives. And God, I pray that you would accomplish your purpose for us. God, I pray that our hearts would be receptive to you. Help us to see areas in our lives that you want us to adjust and make changes to. Help us to have the humility to accept what you have to say for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's kind of early Christian code for the church, the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, he suddenly, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see. He could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. This is the word of the Lord. But what can we learn from the life of Paul? Uh, we'll look at his conversion experience, but we'll also consider 
later in life and some of the things that he wrote in his letters that also confirm what God was doing in his life and the examples that we can follow. Uh, One is that we need to be persistent in prayer. Let's be persistent in prayer. Paul certainly was. Verse 9 says, For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So was he just not hungry? No, he was fasting and praying. We know this because later in verse 11, Jesus tells Ananias, Saul is praying. He has been praying, and you need to be the answer to his prayer. And Saul was not praying because he was blind. He was not praying just because he had a miraculous experience. He was fasting and praying because his whole world had just been turned upside down. Those core values and beliefs that he had held on to all his life were suddenly rocked to the core. And he realized that his understanding of God and God's plan for salvation was totally different than what he expected. He was a well-educated Pharisee taught by the most respected rabbi in Jerusalem, Gamaliel, and he didn't understand how he could have missed God's Messiah. He didn't know where he went wrong. And the main reason he was fasting and praying was because of this heavy weight of shame for his sin. I mean, his hands were covered with innocent blood. Saul must have been overwhelmed with guilt, grief, and regret. He was there when Stephen, the first martyr of the church, was stoned to death. He was holding the coats of the people throwing the rocks. And he led the persecution, that first persecution in Jerusalem. He was hunting down Christians, putting them in prison, and even voting for them to be put to death. He made wives into widows. He made children into orphans. And he thought he was doing God's will. He thought he was cleansing Israel of this heresy. When in actuality, he was fighting against God. There was nothing he could do to erase the sins of his past. He was at the mercy of God. Have you ever had your life just turned completely upside down? Have you ever just firmly believed in something, just been absolutely convinced that you were right about something important, only to find out later that you were wrong? Have you ever made a huge mistake? I mean a mistake that affects others. A mistake that hurts innocent people that has consequences that keep on going. That's how Paul felt. He he knew there was nothing he could do to, to take away all the pain he had caused. God never promises to take away the consequences of our bad decisions in this life. But prayer brings us into the presence of God. Prayer helps us to depend on God for his comfort, for his healing, for his strength, and for his forgiveness. And there are some demons in this world that can only be conquered by prayer. That's what Jesus tells us. Even before he was a Christian, Saul knew that prayer was powerful. He was a firm believer in God and a firm believer in prayer. So for the next three days, he devoted himself to persistent prayer, prayer and fasting. And this is something he continued to practice throughout his life. Many times in his letters, almost every letter, he opens up with a prayer and he tells the people he's writing to that he is always praying for them. And in many of his letters, he asks his readers to pray for him. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he says, pray without ceasing. Don't give this up. This is an important ministry. In Ephesians 6, right after he tells us to be prepared for spiritual warfare by putting on the full armor of God, he says this about prayer. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. God wants us to pray for one another. And Paul knew that this was powerful, this was essential, this was essential for his life, for the success of his ministry and the the proclamation of the gospel. 
So he depended on people praying for him, and he was always praying for others. When we're facing difficult decisions, when our world has been turned upside down, when we're confused and frustrated, when we need guidance and direction, let's be persistent in prayer. What can we learn from the life of Paul? Well, let's put away the past. That's what Paul did. That's what he had to do. He knew his past was a mess. It was all wrong, and he had to put it away. So in verse 18 of Acts chapter 9, it says, Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. And he got up, and he was baptized. Saul felt the weight of guilt and shame leave him. He was guilty of these terrible sins, murder, and and putting innocent people in prison, breaking up families. He realized that he was persecuting innocent people. He was guilty of, of shedding innocent blood. He realized that he was fighting against God, and he needed forgiveness. He needed to some way Have that past washed away. In Acts 26, Jesus told Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. When he first met him there on the road to Damascus, a goad is this long pole that the farmers use when they're plowing the field and it's pointy at the end. It gets the ox to move forward. You poke it a little bit. But if you got a stubborn ox, sometimes the ox will kick that goad to the ox's hurt. I mean, it it hurts bad enough to get poked. It's even worse if you're kicking the thing that's poking you. And that's what Paul was doing to God. I wonder if during this time of blindness, Paul or Saul remembered these families that he had torn apart. I wonder if he remembered putting Christians in jail, if he remembered the faces of the children. I wonder if he remembered the bloody scene of, of those rocks that were being thrown at Stephen, the first martyr. As Saul prayed and fasted for three days, he became convinced that he was the worst of sinners, desperately in need of forgiveness. And he was so relieved when Ananias showed up. In Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, Ananias told Saul, and now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And Saul was baptized into Christ. He knew that his sins were all gone, washed away, and he knew that his past was behind him, and he left it there. God had a new plan for him, and Saul didn't want his past interfering with the future that God wanted him to have. God has a future for you, and it does not involve your past. It does not involve the sins of your past. Don't let the past problems interfere interfere with God's future for your life. We need to have that same attitude. We need to come up out of the waters of baptism and leave our past life behind us. Paul continued to practice this attitude of repentance and renewal throughout his life. He often reminded himself that his old life was dead and gone. Listen to what he says in Galatians chapter 2. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. If you're a Christian... Your past has been washed away. Your sins are gone. You are truly forgiven. You are a new creation in Christ. All the sins that you committed have been washed away. God has buried them in the deepest sea. And he posted a sign there that says no fishing. So don't dig them up. Don't go fishing for your past problems. Let's leave our old past in the past. What can we learn from the life of Paul? Well, let's preach the gospel. Let's proclaim the good news about what Jesus has done for us. Acts 9.20 says, At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Right after Saul was converted, he started sharing his faith about Jesus. In verses 27 and 28, it says that Saul preached fearlessly and boldly. 
And all the people in the synagogues couldn't believe it. This guy is different. He's gone through a radical transformation. In fact, the Jews were angry that Saul had converted to Christianity because he was their star player. He was the mover and shaker who was purging Israel of this Christianity heresy. But now Saul was preaching the gospel and leading other people to Christ. Saul continued to preach the good news about Jesus, even in the face of persecution. He didn't care how popular or unpopular he was. He didn't care how many enemies he had, because he was more concerned about pleasing God than he was about pleasing people. Preaching the gospel is pleasing to God. And he knew that everyone needed to hear the gospel, so he wasn't ashamed of this message. In Romans 1.16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God is looking for Christians who are not ashamed of the gospel. God is looking for Christians who are passionate about sharing their faith, who know just how, how much God has done for them and just how good the good news is. He's looking for Christians who are boldly sharing their faith regardless of the risk. When we share our faith, people might make fun of us. When we tell people about Jesus, they might call us names. When we tell people what God says about sin and forgiveness, they might get offended. We might not be as popular. We might even lose some friends. But God wants us to put our faith in Him and take the risk. He wants us to boldly share our faith in Christ, even when it's not popular. And if we really love our friends and our family members, why wouldn't we tell them this good news? Why wouldn't we tell them about salvation through Jesus? Why wouldn't we tell them about the great gift of eternal life they can have because of Jesus? Let's preach the gospel. What can we learn from the life of Paul? Well, let's practice humility. Let's practice humility. Saul was not an independent lone ranger who never needed anyone's help. He was constantly asking for help and accepting help. When he was blind, his friends led him into Damascus. When there was a plot to kill him in Damascus, his friends helped him to escape. And when all the Christians in Jerusalem were afraid to accept him, here came Barnabas, Mr. Encouragement, to help Paul, Saul still at that time, to be introduced to the apostles and accepted into the Christian community. Acts 9.27 says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas, by the way, is a nickname. It means son of encouragement. His real name was Joseph. And the apostles just knew this guy was so generous and encouraging, they had to give him a nickname. And he lived up to that nickname. He came alongside of Saul and said, hey, let's, let's get you introduced the, to the apostles and show that you're the real deal here. And we all need help from time to time. God is looking for people who are humble enough to ask for help and accept help. Some at-risk people would rather stay put in a difficult and dangerous situation than be led to safety. That's what helicopter pilot Ian McConnell and the rest of his air station crew discovered in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. McConnell and his crew were given orders to keep five H-60 helicopters airborne on missions around the clock to airlift stranded people from their rooftops and deliver them to the Superdome in New Orleans. But they were only able to save a relatively few amount of survivors. On our first three missions, we saved the lives of 89 people, three dogs, and one cat, he said. On the fourth mission, to our great frustration, we saved no one. But not for lack of trying, dozens of people 
were in need of rescue, and we attempted to rescue them, but they refused to be picked up. Some people told us to simply bring them some food and water. You are living in unhealthy conditions, and the water will stay high for a long time, we warned them. Still, they refused. In truth, they did not know how desperate their situation was. Friend, if you're not a Christian, if you have not put your faith in Christ and been baptized into Christ, you may not know it, but you are in a desperate situation and you need Jesus. In a similar way, Saul did not know how desperate his situation was until he met Jesus. Before his conversion, he was a proud Pharisee with a long list of accomplishments. But God humbled him. God took away his sight for three days, and he, God gave Saul a crash course in humility. God does humility really well when people need to learn it. In Philippians 3, Paul tells us about all the things that he was proud of in his B.C. days, his before Christ days. Listen to his list. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He goes on to say, there's one thing that I'm aiming for, that is to know Jesus and to know him better every day. As a Pharisee, Saul was proud of his accomplishments. He was more righteous than all the other Pharisees, and it was a big competition in that group. He had all the best education and training. He was trained by the great Rabbi Gamaliel, the best in Jerusalem. He was climbing the ladder of success, and he really believed that he was going to earn the favor of God and fulfillment in life by all his accomplishments. But when he met Jesus, Saul realized how helpless and desperate he was and how his pride actually caused him to miss the Messiah. When he was blind and being led into the city, he knew that all his accomplishments, awards, and trophies were worthless. Only Jesus could save him now. Sometimes God will give us a crash course in humility. Sometimes God will allow things to happen in our lives that will remind us of how desperate our situation is, that we need to let go of our pride and ask for help. And we can either learn humility the hard way through personal experience, trial and error, or we can learn the easy way by practicing humility and putting away our pride. Let's practice humility. And let's remember just how much we need Jesus. If you're not a Christian... You may not know it, but your situation is desperate, and only Jesus can save you. So let go of your pride and come to Jesus. Practice humility and recognize that he can save you, and he's the only one who can save you. Well, there are many other lessons that we can learn from the life of Paul, but here are four things that helped Saul of Tarsus become the man that God wanted him to be. And these are four important principles, four things that we can put into practice that will help us become the people God wants us to be. Let's be persistent in prayer. Let's put away the past. Let's Preach the gospel. Proclaim the good news about what Jesus has done for us. Let's practice humility. We're going to pray and we'll sing one more song before we're dismissed. Uh, And as we do that, let's think about how God wants us to respond to his word this week. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for these examples throughout the Bible that we can learn from, both from their mistakes and from their accomplishments. Thank you for 
this powerful testimony of the Apostle Paul and, and what you did to radically transform his life and turn him into a, a person you could use to accomplish great things for your kingdom. God, we know that you have a good plan for us as well. We pray that you'd help us to follow that example, help us to be persistent in prayer and to put away the problems of our past. God, help us to proclaim this good news. Help us to preach the gospel. Let people know the good news about what Jesus can do in their lives. And God, most of all, help us to practice humility. We, we know that we are woefully inadequate for the struggles and difficulties and challenges we face in life. Help us to have the humility to ask for help and to accept help. And most of all, help us to have the humility to come to you, knowing that you are the only one who can save us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. be more loved than I am right now wasn't holding you up so there's nothing I can do to let you down it doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now going through a storm but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. You would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. You are a
Thank you. 